Santa and Carlin again for inviting me back, and thank you to Dawn for a great organization. Um, really appreciate being here and talking to you all. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a hip and knee replacement surgeon at UCSF, um, and have a fun time doing what I do. Uh, my disclosures are that I do some teaching and consulting for Depew, uh, which uh, is relevant to this talk because it's the implants that I, I use for some of my surgeries. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the burden of disease and epidemiology and, and the expected landscape over the coming decade. I'm going to go over kind of the basics of osteoarthritis management as well as the basics of what the surgeries are that we do and kind of talk about what's changed over, over the last decades and hopefully give you guys some practical tips for managing and also advising your patients. So first of all, I'd like to say a big thank you. I mean this sincerely every year when I say it. Um, I think primary care is probably the hardest job to do well in medicine, which is why I didn't think that I could do it uh, when I was going through training. Um, and I truly appreciate all the care that you give to our patients, and I've had just a fantastic time managing our patients with our primary care physicians in this community and at UCSF. And now I'd like you to meet Rose. Um, John, can you play that for me, or how do I? Uh, <laughs> So uh, when Rose came to us, she was in a wheelchair um, from horrible, horrible hip arthritis. And she was super depressed because she couldn't dance at her, uh, at her living center where she lives. And this is about six weeks after her hip replacement. And she is back to her dancing self. You know. And it's just fun. Oh, they were little. I mean, when you did that with them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just worth watching the whole thing. Hey, Macarena. Say this. So that's, that's why I love what I do. You know, you really get to take patients out of pain, improve their quality of life, and it's a pretty, pretty special and lucky thing. Um, the burden of disease is high. About a quarter of people in this country have doctor diagnosed osteoarthritis or some kind of arthritis, and about half of those have symptomatic activity limiting disease, which means that in our country, somewhere between 12 to 15 percent of people have symptom limiting activity related osteoarthritis. Uh, the costs of this to our country are very, very high. Back in 2003, there was an estimate done that. Uh, accounted for about 1.2% of GDP, which is kind of insane if you think about it. Uh, and that's probably only gone up. So this accounts for uh, the two of the most common surgeries that we do for the Medicare age population. Knee replacement is the most common surgery for Medicare age patients, and hip replacement is the fourth most common surgery. We're doing millions of them a year in this country. Uh, and this is only projected to rise. This study was published in 2005 uh, and showed the prevalence of hip and knee replacement in the country expected to increase by over 600% over the course of 25 years for knee replacement and 170% for hip replacement. And if we look at where we are today from 2005, we, are, are, we think we are meeting or actually exceeding these curves in terms of the number of surgeries that we're doing. The reason really is because of our aging population. Uh, the silver tsunami is real. Patients are living longer and they're healthier and we're better at managing their medical disease around surgery and so they're able to have the surgery. So there's a huge aging population. The other reason is that patients are now receiving arthroplasty at a, at a younger age. The average age for an arthroplasty in this country is in the early 60s, both for hip and knee replacement, but there's a larger and larger percentage of patients who are receiving these surgeries in their 50s and even 40s. The reason for that, I think, is largely attributable to two factors. One is obesity. Um, about a third of hip and knee replacements can actually be directly attributable to obesity, and obesity causes patients to need a joint replacement 10 years sooner than they otherwise would have. Also, improvements in technology have made this possible. We're willing to implant these uh, devices in patients in a much younger age than we were 20 years ago. So arthritis at its basics is cartilage degeneration. It causes pain, limp, swelling, loss of range of motion, and eventual bony deformity. 
it's not actually the loss of cartilage itself that hurts, it's all of the resulting inflammation and mechanical symptoms that it causes, which is why the symptoms go up and down. It's, and I think this can be very confusing for patients. It's, it's not like their arthritis changes from month to month, but their symptoms come and go. The causes are primary wear and tear osteoarthritis. We still don't fully understand how this happens. Uh, inflammatory arthritis, although this as a cause and need for surgery has gone down significantly with the rise in some of the really kind of amazing drugs that we have to treat inflammatory arthritis. Trauma and old fractures, this is particularly relevant for the hip population. Uh, osteonecrosis or avascular necrosis, which is simply the bone dying beneath the cartilage, and developmental disease, particularly for hip dysplasia. So in order to make the diagnosis, it's largely symptomatic and largely radiographic. So what you need to do is just get x-rays, but please make them weight-bearing. For the knee, get an AP, a Rosenberg, which is essentially a bent knee PA view, a lateral and patellofemoral view. For the hip, you get a low AP pelvis and a frog leg lateral. For the knee, the Rosenberg view or the PA view is particularly important because as we walk, we spend most of our time in the stance phase of gait on a bent knee, and this reveals the posterior aspect of the femoral condyle as it articulates with the tibia, and that will actually show arthritis in a number of cases where you wouldn't see it on the plain AP. For the weight-bearing x-rays, as you can see in this example, the, this, uh, this patient in x-ray A doesn't really look like they have arthritis, but as soon as they put weight on, you can see that they don't really have much cartilage left there. MRIs are rarely, rarely necessary for the diagnosis of arthritis. They're expensive, they bring in a lot of other issues, and they can often lead to unnecessary treatment um, and patient anxiety. So I know that there's sort of a very high demand from patients for MRIs, but I, uh, I, I say no, you know, 95% of the time to my patients unless they have a clear indication. I try to explain why. Um, but I, also, I have seen a lot of unnecessary treatment come from getting MRIs. Interestingly enough, weight-bearing x-rays are often used by uh, stem cell replacement companies to tout the benefits of stem cells. So this was from some random website, and you see this all the time. You see this in airplane magazines a lot, where uh, you see, oh, look, we've uh, improved arthritis by our stem cell treatments when it's really just a weight-bearing x-ray and a non-weight-bearing x-ray. <laughs> no. Sneaky. Uh, so this is what hip arthritis looks on the x-ray. Essentially, the, uh, the hip on this patient's right is normal, and the hip on the left is totally destroyed. You can see joint space narrowing, paraticular osteophytes, subconchal sclerosis, and cysts. This is sort of an extreme example. Um, this patient would get a lot of benefit out of hip replacement, but uh, this is uh, basically what it looks like. It's the same, similar process in the knee. Inflammatory arthritis is a little bit different. We all know it's autoimmune. This is a significantly higher risk population, so it's important to, uh, you know, whenever I get an inflammatory arthritis patient, my, you know, my, my index of anxiety goes up in terms of their treatment. Uh, there's been some really, really good recommendations that have come out around perioperative medication management um, between the American College of Rheumatology and the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons. This came out in 2017. It's an excellent guideline that you can use to help you manage these medications around surgery for these patients. Trauma is an ever-increasing problem for us. Uh, the we all know that, again, because of the silver tsunami, we're facing uh, osteoporotic fractures in a much higher degree than we ever were before. In this country, this coming year, we're expected to have about 2 million hip fracture patients. Now, almost all of those patients will have surgery for their hip fracture. We know that that significantly decreases mortality, and they should have surgery for their hip fracture for most of them. But what we also know is that as many as 30% of those patients in some studies will go on to degenerative arthritis even after their hip fracture is fixed. So we're seeing an increasing number of patients who have fractures and then need surgery. This patient population is also different, just like the inflammatory arthritis patient population. They have a much higher uh, perioperative risk, and so it's important to manage them and counsel them appropriately. The other important part of this population is that for most of the osteoporotic fractures, it's a real it's a time where we can intervene differently and try to prevent the secondary fracture, try and prevent the lumbar fracture, the disradius fracture, fracturing their other hips. So management of their bone health after their index fracture is really critical.
Osteonecrosis, uh, we sort of see this as being kind of a steady state in terms of the numbers that we see uh, of this. The main causes are steroids, uh, HIV, and also the, the treatment for HIV. We're not sure whether or not it's the HIV itself or the, highly, or the antiretroviral therapy or a combination of the two that can cause this, and then alcohol. Um, I think alcohol is probably has a much higher prevalence than we realize. About 15 to 20 percent of AVN that we see s seems to be idiopathic, although I suspect that alcohol probably plays a, a bigger role in that than we realize um, or than patients realize. Uh, childhood hip disease, we're seeing less and we've seen less and less and less of this over the decades. Uh, this come in all spectrums. The patient on your, uh, on your left um, has much more mild dysplasia, although certainly still significant than the patient on your right um, who has a uh, congenital hip dislocation. The, because of pavlocarnis and spicocastin and all of the ex, uh, you know, wonderful examinations that our pediatricians do to catch this, we're seeing this a lot less, and so this is a lower burden of disease. That being said, the mild dysplastic patient, we are seeing those patients go on to hip replacement sooner. So someone who didn't have a positive hip exam as a child, wasn't referred to an orthopedic surgeon, but has mild dysplasia, they may go on to hip arthritis in their 40s as opposed to much later. In terms of non-operative management for osteoarthritis, I know that many of you are well-versed in this, and I'd just like to sort of talk about what I see as, as kind of my algorithm to this approach. There's a number of guidelines out there from the European Union, from ACR, from AAOS, from there's the NICE guidelines, the ORC guidelines. If you do a deep dive into a number of these guidelines, and I did this last year, you, you start to understand a lot of these guidelines are utterly dependent on how they actually view the evidence. And the guidelines get more and more and more restrictive as they sort of view the evidence in a more and more and more restrictive manner. So for instance, the most recent AOS guidelines did not include any meta-analyses. They did their own network meta-analyses, and that's how they came out with their guidelines. What that means is that some of these guidelines are based on very, very few studies. What it also means is that our toolbox gets smaller and smaller in terms of the guidelines, and this is somewhat frustrating. What's particularly frustrating about this is none of these guidelines are able to give us any recommendations for these treatments in combination. So none of them can say, hey, if you give your patient a brace and some anti-inflammatories, are they going to get better than just the brace alone? Right? They just say, well, we're not sure about the brace. So I think you have to take these guidelines with a grain of salt, and I think you have to really work with your patient in terms of management. I think the things in these guidelines, though, that are particularly useful is that opioids are bad, right? We all know the opioid crisis is a huge, huge problem. Opioids do not help arthritis in the long term or the short term. You know, they, and I think this is, it can be a real problem as our patients get started on them and perpetuate it. And, you know, we all know that this is a major problem in our society today, but I will not prescribe opiates for arthritis for my patients. It's a, it's a, a, a period for me. You know, we need them around the perioperative management, but I will not prescribe opioids for osteoarthritis. The other thing that I'd like to highlight in some of these guidelines is hyaluronic acid. This is a very controversial topic, and the recommendation from the AOS was particularly controversial around this. A lot of this has to do with expense, but because the AOS recommended against um, uh, hyaluronic acid for treatment of osteoarthritis, that means that insurance companies are now sort of given free reign to deny it. Uh, which is a little bit frustrating, for, particularly for the patients who have allergies to steroids or for the patients who, who really aren't good surgical candidates and we're trying to help them somehow. There are studies that support hyaluronic acid. Now, it is expensive, so I think you have to use it judiciously, but I think it has benefits for certain patients. So outside of the guidelines, this is sort of my treatment management algorithm for osteoarthritis. So first I'll say if the patient really doesn't have much arthritis on their x-rays and they have clear symptoms of some kind of meniscus tear with catching or locking or symptoms of a labral tear with mechanical, with mechanical pain, then I think you can refer them to a surgeon to discuss whether or not they need surgical management of that particular problem. But if they have more than minimal arthritis, then you don't have to jump to a surgical referral right away. If their body mass index is high, you know, starting a weight loss program and trying to engage them in that is pretty critical. There's good evidence that shows that weight loss can dramatically help people's pain. And we've definitely, I've had patients who have lost enough weight where they've actually canceled their surgery because their knee didn't hurt anymore, which is fantastic. <laughs> 
Um, if their BMI is normal, then you can start with all of the things that are less invasive, have low complications, and are evidence-based. Education, aerobic exercise, strength training, physical therapy, ice and heat, and you can do all these things in combination. Those can also be done in addition to the weight loss program for the patients with an elevated BMI. If those things are working, great, then we don't need to start medications or do injections. If those things aren't working, then we can start to discuss, you know, Tylenol, NSAIDs, tramadol, depending on whether or not the patient really is sort of having an acute flare, bracing, use of a cane or gate aids, and injections, either steroids or hyaluronic acid. And I think depending on what the patient wants or needs, you can do all of these things in combination. I think one of the key parts about this in counseling the patient is to make sure that they know that each of these interventions is not going to solve their pain, right? Tylenol isn't going to help them, and they all say, oh, Tylenol doesn't work. But if you tell them, look, you know, Tylenol may take 5% of it away, and then the ibuprofen may take 10% of it away, and then the brace is going to help 10%, and then all of a sudden their pain is getting a lot better with the combination of interventions, then you, you can, you know, help them live with it. It's also key to educate them that the pain will come and go, that that's normal, that they're not going to damage the knee or make the arthritis worse by going to being active on that. Another, the way that I tell that to my patients is that their knee isn't going to hurt them, or they're not going to hurt their knee. Their knee is just hurting them. You know, they can go be active on it. It's okay. And if those things, if they respond to those things and you continue treatment, if they really aren't responding to those things, then it's worth having them talk to a surgeon because that's really when you have a quality of life discussion about whether or not surgery is, is the right decision at that time. So the surgeries we perform, we perform hip and knee arthroplasty, both partial knee replacements, full knee replacements. Hip arthroscopy and knee arthroscopy in this country are largely the domain of our sports, our, uh, sports surgeons, and sort of these you know, were becoming further and further subspecialized, so I haven't done a knee scope in years. Um, and that's probably a good thing, you know, the more that we do of one thing, the better we are out of it. So what is an arthroplasty? Basically, it's replacing the joint. What we do is replace the disease surface with a combination of metal and plastic and ceramic. It's a very high impact intervention. Multiple, multiple studies show that this dramatically improves patients' quality of life, improves their function, decreases their pain medication requirements, helps them return to work um, over a long period of time. It's also a highly cost-effective intervention. And if you look at both the combination of the impact of the intervention as well as the cost-effectiveness, you can make a strong argument that, in particular, total hip replacement is arguably the most, the most effective, in, both from a pain and function standpoint and cost, intervention that we do in medicine. So this is what a total hip replacement is. Essentially, it's a socket that replaces the acetabulum that's usually made of titanium, a liner inside that socket that is almost always now made of highly crosslinked polyethylene, although there are some metal and ceramic liners, a head that is either made of ceramic or metal, and then a stem that is almost always titanium. In this country, most of the hip replacements are done with, uh, without the use of bone cement, although in Europe, a large majority are done with the use of bone cement. Both work equally fine. It's largely historical for that reason. And this is what it looks like when it's all said and done on the x-ray. So you can see that the patient now has you know, a nice, shiny new hip to replace their arthritic hip. Looks much better than the one before, right? A knee replacement is essentially the same thing. We divide the knee into compartments, medial, lateral, and patellofemoral. The femur is replaced with usually cobalt chrome. The, the tibia is replaced with either titanium or cobalt chrome. The liner that goes inside is usually the same highly crosslinked polyethylene, and then there's also a liner that goes on the back of the kneecap that replaces the cartilage surface on the kneecap. The vast majority of knee replacements in this country are cemented instead of cementless. That's uh, largely because cementless implants had some higher failure rates. And now cementless is sort of coming back into vogue as we treat a younger patient population, although I think we'll still see mostly cemented, and it has a very high longevity. One of the misconceptions about knee replacement is that patients think we're sort of lopping off the end of their femur and lopping off the top of their tibia. In reality, we're remo removing a very s sort of thin section of bone around the end of their femur. You can kind of think of it almost like a resurfacing and from the top of their tibia, and this is sort of what it looks like when it's all said and done. This is, and the partial knee placement is essentially the same thing, just with part of the knee. So metal and plastic, removing a very small amount of bone to replace the, the knee joint and restore the biomechanics.
Revision surgery is a much different ball game. Uh, the most common reasons that knees fail in this country in this day and age are number one is infection, followed by loosening of the implant from the bone, then periprosthetic fracture and instability of the knee. We need to do a whole variety of things to reconstruct these problems when they happen. Um, these are large surgeries to go through. Uh, the outcomes overall are relatively good, but they're certainly not as good as the primary knee replacement the first time around. Similarly, with hip, uh, with hip revisions, the number one causes are infection, loosening of the implant, fracture, and dislocation. As you can see, we need to do some fairly uh, intense and creative things to restore the the hip when these problems occur. Um, this is about 30% of my practice is revision surgery because it's sort of the referrals that we get at UCSF. Again, most of these surgeries work relatively well, but the outcomes are certainly not nearly as good as for the primary hip replacement the first time around. So some of the changes in arthroplasty that we've seen over the last 10 years, number one is the longevity. We no longer sort of consider patients kind of too young for arthroplasty. It's really about their quality of life. There are patients who were seen in their you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s with avascular necrosis who have a really pretty miserable quality of life because of their joint, and it's probably worth it to make that trade-off for quality of life to have a, a really good several decades of quality of life knowing that they may need a revision down the road. But that's a, a decision that we make with our patients depending on their diagnosis. In general, I tell patients, and this is a gross generalization, that there's approximately a 1% failure rate per year for any given reason for a joint replacement, which means that at 20 years, approximately 80% of people still have their joint replacement and then functioning well. So for a 40-year-old, if they have a 1 in 5 chance of needing a revision within the next 20 years, but their hip or their knee is making them absolutely miserable, that may be a trade-off that they're willing to make. There's also a pretty dramatic change in expectations in arthroplasty in terms of what people are doing with their implants. Uh, so this gentleman here is not my patient, but he had a hip replacement. He's still water skiing. Uh, we now have patients who want, who, who want to run marathons on their hips. We have patients who ski and bike and do all these things on their joint replacements. We don't know how these implants will stand up to this kind of high impact activity over time, but time will tell. So I caution my patients to pursue it in moderation. There's also a pretty significant change in implant technology that allows us to perform these, these operations for patients at a younger age. In particular, the plastic liner that we use changed around the turn of the century, and the data from that in terms of its wear rates is really, really impressive. So at 15 years, we're seeing almost no wear for a lot of the hip replacements, which means that theoretically these implants could last 30 years or more for people, which is a big change from what it used to be and, and a pretty wonderful thing. The other question is, is whether or not someone's too old for arthroplasty. We're doing these in patients who are older and older now, and there's some data that helps guide us. Again, it really boils down to quality of life. When you look at the data for octogenarians and nonogenarians, there seems to be no difference in one-year mortality when age-adjusted for expected mortality rates from the joint replacement. However, there is a significantly higher complication rate uh, in this patient population. For patients over the age of 90, that complication rate approaches something around 20%. Now, that complication rate could be very, very, that complication could be very, very minor or it could be severe, but it's important, you know, we counsel these patients very strongly if that they can avoid the surgery, it's still worth doing so to avoid the complication, but for many of them, they actually still get a large benefit in their quality of life from these, these operations. In frailty and medical comorbidities actually pay, play a much bigger role than, physio, than actual age. You know, physiologic age, as we know, is a, a bigger predictor of the complications as well as the success of the surgery. So for a patient who's 60 and incredibly unhealthy, their risk is much higher than for a patient who's 80 and healthy. Another big change is the pain management in and around surgery. So we use a multimodal non-opiate based pain control regimen using regional and spinal anesthesia and around the clock uh, Tylenol, uh, anti-inflammatory and gabapentin. We try to get most of our patients off of narcotics with, uh, very quickly. Uh, we're trying to get our hip replacement patients off of narcotics within one to two weeks and our knee replacement patients off within four to six weeks. Some of our hip replacement patients take almost no narcotics nowadays. Our knee replacement patients still seem to need some, uh, especially with physical therapy for the first few weeks, but we're really trying to wean them off.
A lot of this also is doing is with the change in expectations of the patients. One of the nice things about the opioid crisis being in the news is that patients are much more aware of it and they're much more afraid of it, which helps us get them off of the medications because you know surgeons are well aware of the role we play in the opioid crisis. Another important change over the years has been DVT prophylaxis and management. Uh, we're no longer having to use some of the kind of more toxic and dangerous medications for DVT prophylaxis. The vast majority of our patients are now on aspirin uh, for DVT prophylaxis. We risk stratify them. This has been a major improvement. We don't need to monitor it. There's been a decrease in wound complications, a decrease in bleeding, and a decreased risk of the need for transfusion. All of our patients also receive neuroaxial anesthesia, rapid mobilization, and SCDs while they're in the hospital, and this also improves their uh, DVT risks. We do risk stratify our patients, so for the patients who are at higher risk, we will place them on usually a noxaparin. If they were on a 10A inhibitor for another reason coming into surgery, we'll place them back on that. Same thing with Coumadin, although there is some evidence that suggests that 10A inhibitors actually may lead to an increased risk of infection, and we're not sure why. And there's a good guideline from the AOS about this if you want to get into it. Another important question that often comes up both for primary care physicians and for us is dental prophylaxis. We used to put all of these patients on uh, antibiotic prophylaxis for all of their dental procedures. And uh, there have been a number of different guidelines that have come out over the past uh, couple of decades about this. But the most recent one essentially boils it down to we really don't know if this makes any difference. We know that dental work floods the body with bacteria, but we don't know whether or not that bacteria actually increases the risk of periprostatic infection, because it turns out when you brush your teeth, you flood your body with bacteria anyways. I'm not going to take in, I'm not going to ask my joint replacement patients to take an antibiotic right before they brush their teeth. Um, and we don't know whether or not taking the antibiotic makes a difference in terms of their risk for actually seeding the joint and getting infected. And there are risks in the antibiotics. So the bottom line from this recommendation is that in general, patients with a prosthetic implant, prophylactic antibiotics are not recommended prior to dental procedures. Now, for some patients who are super high risk for an infection or who have a history of infection, we'll still place them on the antibiotic. I think that's more of a patient and physician comfort thing than anything else. We don't really have evidence for that. In terms of the recovery, this is actually a, a big sort of thrust in arthroplasty over the last four or five years. So a lot of, a lot of our uh, patients in the arthroplasty world now are actually going home the same day. So this is becoming an outpatient procedure. For the patients who don't go home the same day, the average stay is one night in the hospital. The vast majority of patients are actually able to go home and don't require a skilled nursing facility. Some of this requirement for the skilled nursing facility actually has a lot more to do with whether or not they have help at home than anything else, but medically they don't need to be in a skilled nursing facility. And we have advanced what we call ERAS or enhanced recovery after surgery protocols throughout the entire episode of care. Now, there's a increasingly large move towards outpatient surgery that's actually being driven by Medicare. Last year, Medicare removed total knee arthroplasty from the inpatient only list, and this year they're removing total hip arthroplasty from the inpatient only list. Now, there's a large feeling in the arthroplasty community that this is not being done by Medicare to protect patients. It's being done because then Medicare gets to pay us a third of what they pay us for the inpatient surgery for the exact same surgery. Um, that being said, when we're starting to do outpatient surgery for the right patients, patients are actually very happy. It's really nice to go home and not have to stay in the hospital and be woken up when you don't want to be woken up and eat hospital food and all of those kinds of things. But we're still, as a community of arthroplasty surgeons, really trying to figure out who is the right patient who can be who can go home right after surgery or who needs to stay in the hospital. And this varies dramatically by patient population. Um, some hospitals with certain patient populations are sending as many as 75 or 80 percent of their patients home the same day. Other hospitals with a you know older, sicker patient population are sending as few as 10 percent of their patients home same day. So this is our protocol. Every patient gets an outpatient assessment whether to determine whether or not they're their candidate for surgery. They take a preoperative class. They sign up for an engagement app. They get you know, lots and lots of communication before surgery. They have a preoperative anesthesia assessment. They get risk stratified for physical therapy and DVT prophylaxis. Once they have their surgery, they get a same-day physical therapy assessment and mobilization. The next day, they get cleared by physical therapy to discharge home if they're still in the hospital, and then they get a four- to six-week follow-up. They don't need a lot of inpatient, in in-person follow-up. Usually, that follow-up can be once or twice after their joint replacement, but we found that it's very helpful if they have some kind of electronic follow-up that's 
a, a really sort of good touch point. So right now we use an app and they get messages several times a day during their recovery on this app to make sure that they're doing okay. They do check-ins, they give us their pain scores. And so it's been really, really helpful for our patients to have that kind of close engagement. In terms of risk reduction, uh, this is an important part where we partner with all of our primary care providers in order to help us with this. So in our protocol, and this is different for every, every place, but in our protocol, we require that their hemoglobin A1C be under 8. We're not sure whether or not it's actually the perioperative glucose management or the hemoglobin A1C that makes the difference, but we think that this is probably the best proxy for the patient's ability to control their blood sugars, and blood sugar management after surgery dramatically reduces the risk of infection. We will not operate on people who are smoking or using nicotine. Um, and that has actually become a hard, a hard line for us. There's an increasing body of evidence that shows that nicotine dramatically increases the risk of infection. It's a huge vasoconstrictor. And so if you think about it, when blood can't get to a healing site of surgery, there's probably a higher risk of bad things happening. So we won't even give our patients a surgery date until we have negative nicotine tests. Um, what's been actually kind of wonderful about this is that I've had patients who I've now done multiple joints on who have actually been able to maintain their nicotine cessation. I had a guy who was in his 60s who had been smoking for 40 years. He quit for his knee replacement. Then I did his other knee, and then I did his hip, and now he's two and a half years, and he hasn't restarted. And he said this was what helped him quit. Pain is, a motivating, uh, is very motivating for patients. So. Um, we also have an obesity cutoff, so it, there's a lot of studies looking at obesity and risks of surgery. And unfortunately, even though we know this is a high-impact intervention, even for patients who are obese, their quality of life improves, we think that based on the literature that the risk stratification kind of changes once their BMI hits 40 and that the risks of infection in particular outweigh the benefits of the surgery at this point. So we engage our patients in weight loss. Um, this is particularly challenging. I think this is the hardest thing for patients to do, but the, for the ones who can achieve it, it also dramatically helps their pain uh, with their other joints, lowers their risk of developing arthritis in their other joints, and makes their recovery a lot easier. For patients who are on chronic opioids, we work with them to try to decrease their dose by 50% before surgery. It turns out that their outcomes are a lot worse if they're on chronic opioids going through surgery. The recovery is much harder, and the risks are higher because we have to use a lot more opiates to control their pain during, during and after surgery. For substance abuse, we have a minimum documented sobriety period. For us right now, it's six months, um, and we have random tests that we ask them to do. Um, and this has been particularly helpful, and most patients will engage on us with this as well. Another thing that's coming up in the literature more recently is, is the comorbid conditions of depression and anxiety. It turns out that this has a significant impact on outcomes after surgery. Patients who have uh, anxiety and depression, particularly for patients who have poorly treated anxiety and depression, have significantly worse outcomes from surgery. And so for patients who have those conditions, we're trying to maximize their treatment for their depression and anxiety before their surgery. However, we're not clear if this risk is actually truly modifiable or not. Just to go over some other questions or myths that you guys will probably hear from your patients. So platelet-rich plasma and stem cells for arthritis. I want to be very clear that there is, there is no good randomized controlled evidence for these interventions for osteoarthritis. These interventions are expensive. They are not FDA approved to treat this. They were approved through an FDA device loophole, meaning that they really didn't have to have evidence behind them. And a lot of people are making a lot of money off of these things and not helping our patients, quite frankly. These treatments are expensive. This is just off the internet. Uh, this particular place has a payment plan you can get on for your $5,000 injection if you want. Um, at, least, at least once a week, I sign someone up for surgery who has spent a significant amount of money on these treatments. Um, I think it's, quite frankly, uh, borderline unethical that we're doing this kind of stuff in our country. Um, that's, that's my feeling. I also think that one of the biggest issues with this is that because these companies are making money hand over fist with these treatments, there is no impetus to do the research. You know, this type of technology has huge promise, but no one's doing the studies because the companies are already making the money. Um, another question you'll get a lot about whether or not the body rejects the implants or whether or not there's an allergy to the metal. Uh, there is some debate in, in the arthroplasty world about whether a metal allergy to the implant is actually a true allergy because the immune system inside of the body is very different than the immune system outside the body if someone's allergic to nickel. Uh, 
Um, however, given the number of surgeries that we do a year and the complication rates that we don't see if there were a metal allergy, most arthroplasty surgeons feel that this is not a major issue and that the body does not reject the implant and that the, al the allergy is not a true allergy, even if they have an allergy on their skin to nickel. Um, Gender-specific implants have been pretty well studied and shown not to make a difference. There's a lot of different sizes for the implants, and, and whether or not they're made for women or men doesn't seem to actually make that much of a difference because the sizes now come in two millimeter increments, essentially. Minimally invasive surgery, this is kind of a sales tactic from a lot of surgeons. Uh, you have to make an incision uh, to put the implant in. I mean, it just, it's sort of, you just have to. Um, and it's actually been relatively well studied that the size of the incision doesn't impact the outcome um, or, or the pain scores or the narcotic use or any of the other kind of things that we look at. No, this is not a minimally invasive surgery. It's not an arthroscopic surgery. You can't do it through keyholes. We are doing the surgery, I would probably argue, less invasively than we used to, but it's not minimally invasive. In terms of sort of robotics, computer-assisted navigation, and all of the technology that's coming through the pipeline uh, for, for joint replacement, these are very valid ways to do the surgery. There's more and more evidence for some kind of robotic or computer-assisted surgery with joint replacement. However, it has not been shown to make a difference in, in short-term or long-term outcomes convincingly. Um, but it also hasn't shown an increased risk of complications or, prob or problems. So um, you know, there's probably about 20 to 25 percent of surgeries in this country, particularly knee replacement surgeries, that are now done with some kind of navigation or robotic assistance. I think this technology will probably grow over time and hopefully improve our outcomes. Um, but right now, your patients shouldn't pick their surgeon depending on whether or not they use a robot. So when bad things happen to joint replacements, the complication rate is overall low. In general, I quote my patients, it's about one to two percent with knee replacements and about one, or with hip replacements and about one to three percent with knee replacements for a major complication. But when they happen, they can be particularly devastating and often require further surgery. Now, these complications can be easier to fix if they're diagnosed early. So please don't hesitate to refer back any patient who has new mechanical symptoms or new pain after hip replacement. We want to see them, and we want to see them quickly. In, in particular, I want to talk about periprostatic infection. This is an absolutely devastating complication for our joint patients. It's extremely morbid. It has a high mortality. However, it is better if it's caught early. It almost always requires surgery and often multiple surgeries, but if you can get to the infection and treat the infection quickly, you have a much better chance of success. This may require your patients to be on prolonged or even lifelong antibiotics. And unfortunately, even though we've dramatically reduced the instance of complications for all of the other complications that we've seen in joint replacements, we have not been able to move the marker on this one in terms of its incidence. And I think that's largely due to the difficulty of the eradication of the problem, as well as obesity, which dramatically has in, in, probably increased its incidence even as our treatments have gotten better. So overall, in conclusion, I think that hip and knee arthroplasty is rapidly expanding and will continue to expand. It has excellent long-term outcomes. The recovery is becoming significantly easier for patients. I would ask you to help us modify the risk factors that we can so that we can continue to decrease our risks from this surgery. And please refer any patients very quickly for any painful joint replacements. Thank you very much, and I'll uh, take any questions. Thank you.